Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. go, I don't think I know how to act anymore, or I don't remember anything. <laughs> the first thing you just want to walk up to the direction, you go, is it a problem that I don't know how to do my job? Like, just talking, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. It never goes away. From what I hear from older actors, it, it <laughs> never does. Listeners, it's me, Jack, and I'm here with a very special guest, um, Deep Tran. Would you like to introduce yourself to the podcast at long last? Sure. Hi, I'm Deep Tran. I'm the industry news contributor for Backstage, and I'm and Jack and I are friends because we're both theater nerds in New York City. And then Jack decided to move to Los Angeles, <laughs> right so away. and the sell out to ho- yeah, right sell away. out to Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then the pandemic started everything off, and I was just saying like. I, I've wanted to get deep in here to talk about theater and the Tonys, and we have not really had an opportunity to do that. But deep covers other, th- other things other than the Tonys. And in fact, I don't necessarily even know your connection to Bridgerton and your love of Bridgerton and why your Twitter handle is what at the moment? Lady Whistle Deep. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, why do you love it? What's the deal? Well, I have covered Bridgerton for Backstage. I just did an interview yes. with Julianne Robinson, the who directed the pilot and mm-hmm. the uh, sex montage yes. in Bridgerton. Yes. For we listeners talk- who've never seen Bridgerton, they're not going to we're going to need to give a little bit of context, but I kind of assume that everyone knows. Yeah, yeah, if you're clicking on this episode, you know what Bridgerton is, but you know, I'll, I'll give the short version. And yeah. and I also did a piece about how the whole thing got made and how, you know, Shonda broke up with ABC and oh, yeah. then sold and then sold Bridgerton to Netflix. It was kind of like, is this going to be a big hit? We could have probably guessed that it would be a good, decent hit, mm-hmm. but it it is huge. It is a huge smash. It is huge. I think what's really interesting about Bridgerton, so if you don't know, Bridgerton is a Regency era show mm-hmm. uh, developed by Shonda Land, but the show, but the showrunner is uh, Chris Van Dusen, mm-hmm. who is one of Sh- Shonda Rhimes' protégés. He worked with her on Scandal. And it is about a bunch of rich people in Regency <laughs> England trying to marry off their daughters. Yes, in the fanciest, loveliest costumes. Exactly. So you're watching rich people, uh, <laughs> and their and their intrigues, and yes. the, I think the reason it took off was one, it was in, in the middle middle of the COVID nineteen pandemic, and I there think people wanted an escape from the realities of the world. And the show is very frothy. It's a romance. It's funny. You know, mm-hmm. there's a little there's a little sprinkling of diversity in there where it's not going to be too offensive to the people <laughs> in middle America. And that's oh, why 50 god. million people watched it. Oh my god, totally. <laughs> and in fact, okay, so today's guests on this in the, on this podcast are Nicola Coughlin and Phoebe Dinovor. Dinovor. Mm-hmm. We didn't talk about the identity of Lady Whistledown in this interview. Mm. Should you and I ex- Blaine, maybe for listeners who haven't seen it, but then if they haven't seen it, we can't reveal who it is. It's a no, I, and the thing is, like, I don't think it's it's if if you didn't bring it up in your interview, I don't think it's germane to the conversation. Yeah, I think another part of the appeal was how was how it's really sexy compared to other Regency shows sure. and it's like explicitly sexy. Yeah, yes, like men and women take their clothes <laughs> off. <laughs> The sex scenes are um, copious. Copious. That's great. Yeah. They're elaborate. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of them. And it's something you don't normally find in those kinds of shows. Totally. Totally. There's a a bit of a fantasy element to that, too. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. Female orgasms. Like, that's a fantasy element when it comes (laughs) to period shows. 
Females did not have <laughs> orgasms in period piece dramas before now. Yeah. No, females did not have orgasms, I'm sure, like before <laughs> like the 20th century. In real life. Yeah, in totally. Real life. <laughs> um, well, thank you, Deep. This is all so good. And I do think that we just thread the line pretty perfectly between if there's anyone who hasn't seen Bridgerton, they're still going to like, they have the gist now. And of course, for everyone who did, everyone who did, and who knows who Lady Whistledown is, um, for now, we can just say voiced by the great Julie Andrews. Yes. Who recorded it in her Hamptons home. How do you know the this? Pandemic. Really? Yes. Tell me. I oh did research for the <laughs> article I wrote for Backstage about how Bridgerton got made. Which we will link to in today's episode, of course. Yes, thank you. Um, Deep's articles on Backstage, I thank you so much, Deep, for all of your, like, legitimately informing me about the state of the industry amid COVID. Um, we'll link to some of that in today's episode materials. Is there anything else that um, listeners need to know before we sign off? I think one reason I really love it before we close is yeah. is I feel like in, within our culture, anything that is directed towards a female gaze or anything that women typically love is de- devalued. And so it was really refreshing oh. to see something that's a romance, that's about female emotions and female, not empowerment, but just like the female experience mm. of things to have yes. that be valued and to have that be popular and seen as something that's worth investing in. Uh. What a perfect way to contextual, what a perfect note to end on. That's such, that's exactly what we want from our entertainment. And that is exactly what Bridgerton gave us. Mm-hmm. Um, oh my God, thank you, Deep. This is no so problem. great. I knew this would be great. And we'll have you back, not even necessarily for theater stuff. Again, we'll wait to see what's going on with, with the podcast and <laughs> updating listeners on everything on the saga of the 2020 now 2021 <laughs> Tonys. <laughs> But um, in the meantime, we'd love to have you back for any any and all related, I mean, anything. Yes, I, and I'll be happy to come back and nerd over yeah. and any other properties. Let's do a costume specific, like ugh, we should do a discussion episode about TV and film costuming or like. Oh, I, I, I love know. it. I'm like a big yeah. fan of costume YouTube. Yeah, yeah. And so I, feel like I, there I love are costume. And, who... Yeah, I love costume analysis. Awesome. Okay. Well, I look forward to listening to the interview. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's um, these two, honestly, it was very inspiring. It's almost cheesy inspiring, mm. but they were really fun together. Um, so let's take a quick break and get to this interview. Thank you so much, Deep. Thank you, Jack. The voiceover business is more than just acting. It's a business. Voice actors are auditioning, negotiating, engineering, branding, connecting to sessions from home, and doing thousands of things every day to put them in the best position to succeed. So how do you learn about the business of the voiceover business? That part is easy. The Vocation Conference Online, eVocation. June 11th through the 13th, join experts in the voiceover industry for classes, talks, panels, and forums on the business of the business. For more information and tickets, visit vocationconference.com. Nicola Coughlin studied at drama schools in England and her native Ireland before getting her big break on stage in Jess and Joe Forever, followed by the hit Channel 4 and Netflix comedy Dairy Girls. Phoebe Diniver began as a child actor on the drama Waterloo Road, then starred on Dickensian, Snatch, and TV Land's Younger, both SAG Award nominated as part of the Netflix ensemble drama Bridgerton from Shondaland and creator Chris Van Dusen, here are Penelope Featherington and Daphne Bridgerton, a.k.a. Nicola Coughlin and Phoebe Diniver. Here we are. What a miracle of technology. Wait, wait, where is everyone? Phoebe, where are you? I'm in London. Oh, okay, you're both in London. I'm in LA. <laughs> Great. Um, Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited to talk to you both. How are you? Very good. Thank you. Remind me also, are you both filming season two of Bridgerton? Yes. yes. I know we are. We're only like, we've only recently been allowed to even say it. It was like ah. hot secret for the first month. We weren't like allowed to say anything. And then we were like, why are you in London? I was like, I don't know. Just hanging out with <laughs> Just, uh, it's good that you were being so coy about it because I was like, yeah, we start in a week. 
<laughs> yeah, no, we've been worried. I was like, can I post a picture of like my trailer door that just says Penelope? And they were like, no. I was like, oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's very strict this time around. And I have a lot of like sad Brazilian fans being like, why are you not posting anything? I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm not allowed to do like anything. So yeah. It's that's all like, secret. It's all secret, yeah. So interesting that that's this time around. So of course the first time, Everyone was just like, oh, they're filming this new show. We don't know anything about it. So no attention yeah. was paid. Well, ish, but I'm sure Phoebe can like back me up on this. Like it was still because because of the book series, it had this huge fandom behind it already. And they're mm. like master detectives. So they used oh. to figure out where we were, what we were doing. They were yeah. like, their characters. It was We so had like a small fan squad. <laughs> we had a very small fan base. From the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> very smart like proper proper detectives are just yeah, so they they, were I think they've realized that like they've got to keep everything pretty secret or they'll find everything <laughs> sure well gosh I mean first of all congratulations on the success of the show um your SAG award nominations everything that has thank come you. with it thank you um could anyone have predicted that it would become this big this mainstream I didn't <laughs> Um, I don't know about Nicola. I think there was a sense of excitement from us all because mm -hmm. we loved the books and we would talk about them a lot on set. And again, we would talk about the our small fan base <laughs> um, and how, what they were going to make of the show. Um, and that was a real driving force. But I, I definitely didn't expect it to sort of hit the zeitgeist in the way that it mm. has. And... Mm you know, for everyone to, you know, have heard about the show if they haven't seen it. it. It's quite a surreal thing and sort of only one that something can, that a platform like Netflix can achieve mm. in that sense of like, because yeah. we knew from the beginning it was going out to, you know, a hundred and how many other countries, 150 odd or something. Yeah, something huge, yeah. Something yeah. huge. We knew that from the start, but I don't think any of us sort of thought, I don't know that they'd all well, all the countries <laughs> <laughs> and and the pandemic was a factor as well oh for sure for yeah. sure crazy and I know you've both told the story but how did you get involved this was a self-tape situation um no mine mine was an in-person audition but I think I had like two days with the with the sides I don't think I had a full script at all um mm. so I think in that circumstance and so you kind of just do the work that, with what you have. Like I, I Googled it and realized there were books. But I was like, I'm not going to read these books in two days. So let's just, gotcha. you know, like with any auditionist, like let's just make a choice and it might be the right or wrong one. I don't know. I'll just go and do it. And I'd had a series of really unsuccessful auditions. So I think I was a bit like, I sort of went in and I was like, I'll just do whatever and, and, and see <laughs> what happens. And I met Cole Edwards, who's Kelly Hendry, the casting director's assistant, read with him and he was like, oh, great job. And I was like, yeah, I don't know, like. I didn't leave the audition going, wow, I really did such an incredible job there. I really nailed it. Um, yeah, and then got the call like two weeks later with the offer and was like in shock about it. Because you don't think you're going to get cast in like a Shonda Rhimes Netflix show. That's like such a golden ticket job. Mm. I just don't think my brain even let me believe it might happen, you know? Sure. Mine was slightly different. I was living in, well, I was living in LA. I think I was actually working in New York when I first got the tape through um I feel like this story changes every time because I I, <laughs> I remember more and more detail about it every time I tell it. but I yeah I just put myself on tape for Daphne and then I think a couple of weeks later I they call me back for a different role which I'm not oh. going to say which one it is but sure. it 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 was very different um I never knew that. Different. that's so interesting but, yeah um but I put, but instinctually I was like, this this is going to be, because as Nicholas said, we didn't get any of the scripts, but like both roles were written so well. And, mm -hmm. you know, both scenes, the different characters, they were both so dynamic and so, uh, such interesting female roles that I was like, oh, I'd love, you know, I'd, I'd take either of these mm -hmm. roles in a, in a heartbeat. Um, cool. So well written. Uh, and then didn't hear anything for ages and then sort of got got called in to meet with Betsy and Chris, um, Chris Van Dusen, our showrunner of Betsy Beers, um, 
who's part of Shondaland and met with them and sort of read with them. And then a couple of days later got, got called in with, with reggae and, and mm. read with him. And literally the next day I was, I mean, it was literally the next day I was on a plane flying back with two suitcases full of like all the things I'd been living, like I'd been living in LA for nine months. So I had like, I was like to my flatmate at the time I was like you're gonna have to sell off furniture like you're gonna have to yeah. sort it out I was like I'm so sorry I, I have to go wow. bless her thank god she's still my friend um yeah <laughs> left her with all, all my stuff that I didn't want and um and was you know in rehearsals a few days later it was it was a really crazy whirlwind oh yeah, yeah. but a great well, one a great one well, because we are backstage, we are very much interested in, Nicola, like you said, the failed auditions. I'm going to make yeah. you both relive your, your rejections. Oh, so many. Oh, I have so many. Yeah. Hello, oh, yeah. Oh, get ready. Um, but because, oh, God. <laughs> but we're, I'm very, you know, we're very interested in hearing like the early career, even childhood, and you both did act as children. What was the goal as, as children? Like, was it this? Was it some version of this? I think so. I mean, I I remember like the first time I ever kind of realized acting was a thing, or I don't think I even knew it was a thing, but it was watching The Wizard of Oz and whatever mm. that was. I've just realized now I'm wearing like a pure diary. You're wearing today. I'm like a blue, blue thing. I'm not, that was that was not planned. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just was like, whatever that is, I want to do that. And I don't, I, I didn't know that was the job or whatever. And then I remember seeing my sister in her school play and I went, oh, I'm going to do, I'm going to do that. And it was just, it was just always there. It was like such a deep passion. And then when I was like nine years old, I got my first professional job. It was funny because my parents, I didn't come from a, a background of like performing or anything. My dad was in the army. My mom was a stay at home mom, but I was like the youngest kid and just maybe a bit of an oddball and wanted to do my own thing. And they just let me go for it. And yeah, I got a part in um, a James Brolin film called my brother's war and I was like I had no lines I had to come in and like feed some swans and I got the day off school and I got paid 35 oh, pounds nine you were nine oh. yeah but yeah I got 35 pound paycheck 35 pounds. and I was like this is obviously <laughs> yeah. this is great. I don't oh gosh I don't know I probably <laughs> it's a store I think I probably went to Adams it was like a kid's clothing store that I don't think even exists anymore but they'd really cute stuff so I probably treated treat myself to, to something there yeah, yeah. <laughs> And Phoebe, what was the goal for you? The goal, I remember from a really young age, because I, it's interesting, because I always get interested about how other actors get into the industry, because obviously I I was different. I was from a family where all my family, like, you know, my uncle's a producer, my mm -hmm. grandma was a an AD, my grandpa was a director, like, my dad's a writer. There was always, in fact, like there's not really, my cousins are makeup artists, like they, they're they all in t in completely different parts of the same industry. Mm. Um, so I was just always in love with the industry at first. And like, I want a part in the industry. I want a part in like making these shows happen. I just thought it was so cool. Um, but yeah, I would just hear stories of, of being on sets and things and just being like, I, I, I want to be on set. But I just remember that, you know, my family were like, it's, you know, they would give me the statistics when I was very young because I, I think I would push them at like 13. At 13, I was like, guys, I know I've said this over the years, but I really mean it now. I want to be an actor. <laughs> And I remember them saying, you know, only, I mean, what is it, like 3% of actors work oh, or whatever it is. And <laughs> they would give me all the crazy statistics to be like, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Um, so I think my goal from an early age that was embedded into me was like, the goal was just to keep working. Mm -hmm. And I always just said, I just want to be a working actor. I just don't, I just, and I went through so, I've been through so many periods in my life where, you know, six months to a year, a year was probably the longest, like of just nothing, absolutely nothing, you sure. know? And it's, it's hard, it's really hard. And you have to push through that and you have to, and God, hats off to actors. Cause I mean, we, we have to give ourselves the momentum constantly to keep mm. going because yeah. no one else is going to give it to you. 
Um, it's what I would always say to young people who like are like, well, how do you keep going in those times? And I'm like, if you don't have that insane passion for it, you you won't keep going. It has to be like an overriding because there's always going to be someone that wants it more or it means more to you. And like it's those times when you're like worried how you're going to pay your gas bill and like having to work a crappy job in order to support yourself. It's all those times that are the times you go, there's a reason I'm here. There's a reason I'm doing this and I'm working towards something, you know. And Absolutely. it will always be the time you're about to give up. Yeah. But when you're on the cusp of throwing in the towel, <laughs> that something yeah. will reel you back. Oh, it 100%. Happen. No, I had it's decided really to do Bridgerton. I was like, because I am in another show called Dairy Girls, which is a comedy. It's, it's, it's super different. But I was like, you make up all these things in your head. I think it's just like this like defeatist voice. It's like you've had one successful show. That's it. You'll never be in anything else. You know, you're just going to do that. You're just going to, you'll never get another job. And then I had so many failed editions pre-bridged and I was like, maybe it's right. But like that, it's that voice in your head. You just have to tell it to shut up. It's so unhelpful. It's so stupid. And like, it's just not, and there's no hard and fast rules. I think in an industry where we have so little control over the destiny of our careers in a lot of ways, you try and then impose rules on like, well, this logically means this, but it doesn't. It's all, it's all silliness really. Yeah. Yeah, and I can verify as someone who's I've done this podcast for many years now, and it is so true that it is the moment you're ready to give up that particularly for actors, I guess for all artists, but yeah. that's when the the universe comes calling. Um, and that's really that's really beautiful advice. I'm wondering, is the then the whirlwind of this of this crazy this past year, is the envisioning of the success and the and the wanting it, like you're both saying, is that what then prepares you? for what is essentially like your lives have changed so much. Like, is this this whirlwind that you've both talked about, how do you prepare for it? Like, what is your advice for an actor who's maybe also on the verge of that level of breaking through? Well, I tried to really give Phoebe this advice prior because I, I did have a feeling that yeah. the show was going to be quite big. I just... Mm -hmm. There was just something, it's like all the pieces were seeming to fit together. And I was like, oh, I just feel like, so we went for drinks a few months before it came out. I had decided it was in December. It absolutely wasn't. And I, having sort of had it with Dairy Girls and all of a sudden it kind of blowing up, I was like, I have a feeling this is going to happen with Bridgerton. But like, because it's Netflix, it's going to be a whole different scale. But I don't know, was that in any way helpful to Phoebe, me going, I think your life's about to change. And I think just, you know, like... I feel like this is about to happen. And you were like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah. I think it's sort of the beauty of, of being in this industry for so long before it did happen for me. You know, mm. I was working, prof I've been working professionally for about 11 years and mm. nothing really. I, I just, I just, again, it was just like, I just wanted to be a jobbing actor. And that was my mm -hmm. trajectory trajectory was always just like find the next job find the next job and I don't think it, you ever really prepare yourself for something to hit like Bridgerton did because no. it's it's one of the few things really that you know that there's not many things that hit like that did no. so, so so it was very unexpected mm. in a way and I don't think anything can prepare prepare you for that particularly sure. at the time that it came out which was when people were at home in their houses and and really I think it probably made people way more invested in this story and the characters yeah. and the romance of it all and so that adds something else that adds more of like a a passion for these characters um I do remember actually one thing that I said to you during that conversation I still stick by it is I think the only people who are really going to get it are the other people in the bubble of the show the other actors because it's really hard to explain, I think, what the experience is like to someone outside it. Mm. And we also said to one another, like, you know, my family are probably so sick of me talking about it prior to it coming out because it was so, because it was lockdown. There wasn't much to think about. So we were like, are you annoyed by yourself? Like that you think about it? And I was like, yeah. But yeah, that's one thing I think is it's really hard for anyone. And it's nice to have one another, you know, mm. to kind of go, this is quite crazy, isn't it? This is quite a mad experience. Yeah. I think it's the beauty of being in like a big ensemble cast like yeah. Bridgerton is, which I'm so grateful for, mm -hmm. is that we were all in it together. Mm -hmm. um, and we were all, we all really were, did form like a tight bond. So coming back season two, seeing everyone and us all being like, 
oh my God, we're all in the same room and the pandemic's happened and Bridgerton happened and like, we're here and we're back, we're doing it. Um, it's such a lovely feel, like it's the best feeling ever. And, yeah. Um, and we, yeah, we were all in it together, which, which is such a joy. I couldn't imagine doing this alone, you know? No, it would be so weird and lonely, I think. Mm. Yeah, they, that's such a beautiful, um, the because I had a question about ensemble acting. I do think of a, a show like Bridgerton as having a different style of acting than a show with fewer characters. Like, yeah. I would love to ask, what is the nature, what is what to you both is the definition of good collaboration? And then in particular among actors, like you're saying, what is chemistry? How does chemistry work? Gosh. I think a lot of that is down to good casting, which we had. I, Kelly Hendry is a brilliant casting director, and I think she makes really smart choices. Um, I've had this conversation with Claudia Jesse, who plays Eloise a lot, where we say, "What's what's the standard casting for Bridgerton?" And it's none of us. It's we're not. I don't think any of us are the obvious choices, really. And I think that makes it so much more interesting because I. You know, even the people that came from like theater backgrounds or, you know, had worked in TV for a long time, like like Phoebe has, they're like, there's just such a mix of like Claudia Jesse started in stand up. But it's, I think it's everyone bringing that experience. I always think in an ensemble too, like the best thing you can do is you do your preparation, but be willing to play, never lose that. I don't think you can ever go in deciding what you're going to do because that will really hamper you. And it can be the best thing in the world is when the person opposite you does something you're so not expecting and you go, oh, that totally changes what I'm going to do. I think always, because I think no matter what, you know that meme going around at the, at the moment is like you, who understood the assignment type thing. I think <laughs> always understand the assignment and always like that Bridgerton had the specific tone to, to work towards. Always felt like a big part of it. Wonderful. Yeah. Mm, I agree. I also like, it was so lovely for me watching the show because so much of, my role as Daphne was like with reggae, um, which was, you know, the heartiness of it and the the drama, I guess, of, of the show. Um, but to watch it, that also be, you know, I, I, like the, the sub of like then Eloise and that your dynamic with her and like, the wit of the show, which is so, which makes it so fun and energetic. And I think the wonderful thing about Bridgerton is that it had all those levels and Daphne is a particular level. Uh, it's very, or for season one, it was very much, you know, it was this, it was hers, it was her story and there wasn't really an awareness of any other characters. I think what's lovely about coming into season two is that I get to play with the yeah. other characters a little bit more and there is going to be more of that you know ensemble thing I'm really excited for people to see that as well because I feel like you kind of get to come in and just have a, a citation on the phone oh I said it now but like this, so I feel like you kind of get to let loose and it's really I think it's going to be really fun for people to, to see yeah agreed I hope we I hope we're allowed to say that I was gonna I say I mean it's still vague -ish. I feel like that's all right yeah no, that's great. A little teaser. <laughs> um, can I ask also, this is the nitty gritty, actually crafty stuff. Accents. Yes. You're both masterful at accents. <laughs> um, and Phoebe, you're, in fact, you're Irish on Younger. And Nicola, you're playing a different uh, specific, can we say, dialect of Irish on Dairy Girls? Yeah, it's, that's, do you know what? That accent is much harder than the Penelope accent. It's, it's insanely hard because the word girl, they say girl. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. they have, yeah. my my friend, Cecilia, who's easy in Dairy Girls, said like this one sentence to get into Dairy is, uh, Jerry Adams bought a crop top and top shop. <laughs> So like, but it's not at all like it's funny because like geographically we're much closer but then but I started out doing when I was like in my early teens I did a lot of voiceover for cartoons and stuff yeah um I've always loved accents I've always found them so fascinating and I feel like it really helps me to find that's the first thing I'll ever find with the character is the voice and with Penelope I was like it has to be like she's I feel like she's always scared to project and always scared to like I think of her sometimes like a yo-yo is that she'll go out a little bit, but she has to come back and finding that in her and that softness. And it, oh, it's, it's, you know, it's a real privilege to get to come back and do a second season of a show and to continue with the character and like how that will develop and, you know, all of that. But yeah, I'm a nerd about all that stuff. I could talk about it all day. <laughs> I love that. I'm quite instinctual, I think, 
with mm -hmm. um, work and I think I'll read something and immediately if I don't hear their voice in my head, I, I, I'm like, oh, I don't know if I can find that character. So I, 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 I'm very instinctual and then I just push push the instincts and work with them a little bit. But mm. I definitely found Daphne pretty quickly um, because I just, she's so self-aware and, and that was the main thing that I had with Daphne is like self-awareness. So her voice had to be not just a certain level of, um, it's not posh. Like, like prim and like oh. fine. Yeah. Sort of and yeah, but, yeah, but it also had to be sort of clipped and like she'd almost worked quite hard at forming it herself, you know. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't na it wasn't it might not even be her natural way of speaking it was just oh, something cool. she sort of formed um and Daphne was interesting because she she was such you know she really was a formed she'd formed herself into this thing I think yeah. um which I'm then excited to try to unravel a little bit maybe as the seasons go on who knows but um uh and then yeah, it was the same with Younger, I think. There was just like, I mean, t to be honest, Nicola, there's only one Irish accent I can do and I'm not quite sure <laughs> which one it is. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I I, I think, um, yeah, that I, don't, I don't know about you, Nicola, but I, I'm quite instinctual with things like that. Um, I love watching Nicola because she's, I especially, I, I really loved watching Firstly, she's so different to how she is. I'm just going to, I'm just going to compliment Nicola for the next five minutes because I don't, yeah. know, I don't know how to talk about myself. Um, <laughs> but I, I was like, I'd watched her in Dairy Girls and I didn't see, I never really, we never really worked together that much on Bridget. No, no, we didn't really share many scenes. I mean, there was one scene you were in the feathering house. So I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> this is so yeah. weird. So I don't want to wait for more, but yeah. yeah. But then I, wa I remember watching and you're just so different because in real life you're so you know you're very like confident and like aware of the, what you're saying and to hear this sort of version of of that you this person that you created of Penelope who's like so up here and nervous and shy and it's like it's so interesting to watch you work oh, thank um, you. yeah but it's easy, and I'm sure it's easy with good scripts because it's like the work's really, it's it's there. It's very yeah, it's odd in the page. Yeah. So you don't feel like you have to, I don't know. That process of finding the character. Like yeah, you just it's so much yeah. easier. But it sounds like, so that sounds like physicality and almost, can I call it outside in approach? Mm -hmm. Are there things that you both do for every role for, to prepare for a character? Or is it like starting it from scratch really, for every time? It, it totally depends. I remember when I was auditioning for Dairy Girls, that process was like six months of auditions. It was like really stressful because the more that you audition for something, obviously the more you want it and the more yeah. you become attached. Um, and I just desperately loved it and wanted it so badly. So the character I was playing, she, she's very nerdy, but she's got this like really high nervous, nervous energy. And then when I had so much time to prepare, I made a little book. Um, about her so I had I don't think I had I wouldn't have had all the scripts but whatever I had I like wrote down every fact I could about her cool. um, and like I paid, pasted in pictures from the 90s so of like characters I thought she'd like like Lisa Simpson and Blossom and all that kind of stuff and um, I think it totally depends I mean I went to drama school and I think what's interesting about drama school is it's sort of there's certain things you try they're like animal studies I, I did it and I was like, I don't, I'm never going to use this. I'm never going to crawl around my house pretending to be a llama. Like, it's just not going to help me in any role. But it does give you like a tool belt of, of certain things. But certainly, like what we were saying before, I love to like, find, when, once you find the voice, I feel like that informs everything else. Then I think, I don't really have to think about the physicality so much. It sort of just starts to happen mm -hmm. more so. Like with Claire, I was like, it's all very this. You know, it's all very like frantic and it's all, she kind of can't sit still with Penelope I think she's afraid to move and afraid to like, you know, even like it feels natural, like when she's gesturing that she might do this, but it has to come back to her as well. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, the more that can evolve like naturally and yeah. 
like Phoebe said, instinct, like lean. I love that idea of leaning into the instincts. That's so interesting. Yeah. I think I started because I, I never had any training. So I've just like developed a process on the job, I think. But I think the difference with studying or going to drama school is that they sort of start you off loud like be a tree be loud be weird be crazy Mm. and then they pull it back and refine something I don't know because I've never been but like I was very everything was quite you know because I was a child actor so it was just kind of you know reading on the off off the page and like hoping for the best and and then and being very instinctual because you just you know at 14 just learn your lines and say them yeah And then I, you know, kept doing that until it wasn't really possible to do that anymore. And I think my learning curve has been sort of um, trying to push things and being bolder Mm -hmm. because that's the only, because the way I learned was just saying, learning the lines and saying them. And and I think that works when you're 14, but as you get older, you've, you've got to make, you've got to make bold interesting choices and I think that was definitely my learning my learning journey and and again every job's different the job I film I just I just worked on was very much it was important to do a lot of research because the whole film is about you know a a woman who was a real pioneer in pottery at the time and Mm. and and I really wanted to know what it was like for a working class woman back then and and how they found their feet and that was so informative for the role um, but something like Bridgerton, that wasn't, it was informative and we did have to know a lot of research, but, yeah. it, but we were definitely creating our own world in that sense. So, yeah. so Bridgerton for me was just, there's always like something that I really need to do for a role. And for yeah, Bridgerton, yeah. it was, I need to make this person um, relatable and real mm. and, and modernize her in, in some way. And so everything I, all the work I did was to do with that. But I think, I totally think that every job is different. And I think the only thing I do for everything is read the script a billion times, Mm. like back to front every single bit. Like I want to know what they're saying and why they say it. And I think that's, that's the only thing I would say every role. I know the script. That's Um, great. Yeah, and and especially on something like Bridgerton because we were filming like episode one and six and then like two and three. And yeah. It's so out of sync that you mm. really have to know where the character is at a certain point to be able yeah. to like... I jump, remember my, my the second scene I ever filmed for Bridgerton was walking into the garden and bursting into tears in front of Eloise. Mm. Oh. I was like, oh, oh my God. Like, because I shot nothing with Luke Newton. I'd shot nothing with, with Ruby Barker. Like, nothing. And I was like, this is just madness. It's, 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 you know, it's the challenge of television a lot of the time is that you don't get time to build that dream. Yeah. You just have to, like, go, be ready to go, you know? Yeah. My first scene was Simon going down on Daphne. Oh, my God. The staircase. <laughs> she, she had a sexual awakening right from the get go. <laughs> That's how you can tell, like, people who schedule things are not actors because you were just like, I would never plan it that way. <laughs> totally. The first time this time, this scene, I can't say what it was, but it was just super simple. There was no dialogue. And I was like, this is exactly how you want to start. Ease back into it. Because you have that fear where you go, I don't think I know how to act anymore. Or I don't remember anything. <laughs> yeah. I don't remember anything. The first thing you just want to walk up to the director and you go, is it a problem that I don't know how to do my job? Like, just <laughs> checking, you know. Mm-hmm. I felt like that before. So it never goes away. Ever. No, I don't, from what I hear from older actors, it, it <laughs> never does. And I think that's part of the excitement and joy of our jobs. And I'm sure when I'm, you know, in my 70s or 80s and I, I get a new role, I'll still be like, how am I going to approach this? What am yeah. I going to do? I don't, I don't think you ever really feel comfortable no. as an actor. Well, the, God, the first table read for Bridgerton, I was like uh, so terrified because, you know, just the way that the casting happened, I was like, what if I open my mouth and they go, oh my God, no, not at all. We thought she would be good at this, but she is not. And like, it was intimidating, wasn't it? It was like, you know, Betsy Beers is there reading the stage directions. This is huge room. We had all the Netflix executives and you're like, oh no. I feel like the lesson in this podcast is just <laughs> to be an actor is to constantly <laughs> battle with self-doubt and push yeah, it away. Yeah, kind of. possible. <laughs> It's almost like maybe you're not really 
you're not an actor if you're not doubting. Like, it's almost like the second you guys get really comfortable and confident, something's off. Something's yeah, going to go wrong. Yeah, I think the fear is re- a really good motivation. Yeah. And it's part of, like, the adrenaline rush of doing it or going, I'm really not sure what I'm doing. But, like, yeah, just going in always with an openness and going, like, you know, making a choice. Like Phoebe said, that that's one of the most important things. I remember that at drama school, actually. We had um, this director in and we had, we had like a device, it was a devised piece about the Chilean miners. Oh my. <laughs> it was happening at the time. It was like 2010. So yeah, that was our devised piece. It's such like a drama school thing. Anyway, but I remember we had to play a bunch of different characters in it. I remember one of them. I cared less about than the others. It was like a wife of a minor, whereas the other ones I love playing were like these businessmen who worked in oil and all that. I was like, that's really fun. And he was like, look, he was like, you did some great stuff, but he was like, you made no choices with that wife because you oh. didn't enjoy it. And I was like, oh yeah, oops. So he was like, always make a choice. Just always make one. Mm-hmm. Just don't go and do nothing. And that always has stuck with me because you're, ne- you're never going to know whether you're making the right one, but you might as well just try and then you can rein it back, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I also think that's a mistake. Sorry, I feel like we're talking a lot. But I also also feel that's a mistake that I would definitely make with auditions, um, particularly when I wasn't getting any work. (laughs) I'd go in and be like, try and guess what they wanted. And like, that's a big no-no because you have to go in and be, even if you don't feel confident or whatever, you have to go in and make a, Bold. It goes back to being bold, making a choice, and go, and running with it, and give and and going with it hundred <laughs> um, percent, because you can't, you know, you have to, you have to make a decision as Nicholas. Although says. one time I did, I got like this audition through. It was in the period of really bad auditions, and it was like a tiny part in this film, and she was like a bellhop. And I was like, oh my God, I know exactly what I'm going to do. So I did this like full Marilyn Monroe thing. I did like red lips, I curled my hair and I was all like, and I said to me, she was like, what made you think? (laughs) And I was like, I know, it was just like a bold choice. She was like, okay, now just do a normal one. I was like, okay. (laughs) But I bet they watched that tape. I bet bet they they watched it. I mean, I didn't get it. I don't know whether they ever saw my, I was like, but I was like, also I self tapes I don't really enjoy because you're not a guy. I, I, I'm definitely not like a good critic. I, I start like picking everything apart or going, why am I pulling that face? Or why did I, and all that's not the point. <laughs> you know? yeah. Well, this is why, this is partly why I was interested in talking to the both of you. Like we always ask, what is something you wish you'd known? Or if you could go back in time and tell yourself one, you know, piece of career advice. But it, I almost feel like because one of you went to the drama school route and then theater to TV, and one of you was child acting in TV from the beginning. Like, are there things that you would ask each other or like that you wish you'd known? Like, Phoebe, do you ever wish that you were doing those crazy drama school exercises? <laughs> yeah, I do. I do, because I think it would have taken me out of my comfort zone. And I think mm. it's easier to pull something back than it is to, you know, be bold and I think that was always something that I was trying to that I had to learn was to to be bolder with my choices so yeah it would have been nice to experiment more do do some wilder things but I think you know everyone's journey is unique and mm-hmm. and again for me I, I've just learned so much on the job and, yeah. and work you learn so much from other actors and um watching them work and and something I learned when I was really young and I found quite interesting was, and I won't say what job it is, but I, I, you know, there was a job, I was, I was about 16, I think. And I was watching an older actor and I was doing a scene with him and I, I just didn't understand what he was doing. I, I was like, this is so weird and it's awful. Oh. I don't know what's happening. Um, and then I watched it back and it was incredible. Yeah, that can happen. It's so weird. Mm. So it was such a weird experience for me because I think at that age I was so it was like ingrained into me to be natural because I was so used to having a camera in my face. You know, it's mm. like be natural and do make you know normal choices. So it was so weird for me to see this actor kind of do all these wild things, and I was like, that's not real. Mm. <laughs> and then watching it back, it just it was amazing. And he, he, you know, this is just a guy that had so much experience of being behind a camera and he just you know he knew he knew what would work for the camera um and sometimes it doesn't work when you're opposite 
Um, but it does work on screen, which is fascinating. Mm. Totally. I think um, I would yeah. definitely say to people, like, don't, don't um, sit in the negativity because negativity begets negativity. And it's so, once you get in that frame of mind, it's so hard to get out of it. Because when I left, like, I, it was three years for me to get into a full-time course at drama school. So it wasn't like, I didn't audition and immediately get in. And that was like, you know, it was a whole thing and it's expensive and long and whatever. And then, you know, there's a lot of stuff like people say the silliest things to you or they go, you know, you probably are limited in what you can do because you're Irish or you're limited in what you can do because you look like this. You're limited and you go. And the thing is, I think you're at such a vulnerable point and you're vulnerable all the time, actually, as an actor, (laughs) that you start to believe all that stuff. And I remember I started I moved down to London And I started to work in retail and then I worked with a couple of other actors that were like, well, this is pointless and will never work. And if you don't get a great job and you're out of drama school, you will never make it. You'll never. But again, you're so grasping to try and make things make sense or have control that you start to believe all that. But it's so unhelpful. And I think just, yeah, learning things along the way to always that is always be grateful. Like even if you have if you get an audition that's a huge reason to be grateful because I was a long time I didn't have any auditions at all mm-hmm. and I found that really tough because I was like oh I'm not even having the chance to get <laughs> rejected um but just to like stay hungry for it you mm-hmm. know because it's it's very unlikely to to fall into your lap like it, yeah it does happen for some people mainly men <laughs> let's be honest <laughs> it doesn't happen for many women <laughs> you know you sure. really have to be yeah fighting for it but I think also to know I've worked with actors in the past who they never found the joy in it that they would think this is what I really want I really want to do it but then you would be doing a job with them and it still wouldn't be enough and you go if it's not enough if you're even performing in like a fringe theater with like 20 people in the audience it's still not going to be enough if it's a big Hollywood movie like you've got to find the joy in whatever job you're doing or lucky enough to have I think it's a big thing yeah. That's a great piece of advice, actually, finding the joy in the work as opposed yeah. to where it's going to take you. Yeah. Because... That, that really bugs me when people are like, and then this will lead me onto this and this. I'm like, well, just sit in it and just appreciate what you have because so few people get to do this as a job. You know, we're mm-hmm. one of the very lucky few, really. Totally. That 3% and... or thereabouts number. Um, well, thank you so both so much. That was, this is all really, really, I really genuinely think early career artists in particular can get so much out of, out of what you've been saying about how to navigate the before and after Mm. of success, quote unquote, Mm. and how the problems and the self-doubt don't really go away after the success. (laughs) Oh my God. That's such a good, you know, I'm, I'm sat here in front of you and I'm very grateful for it, but it doesn't go away. (laughs) Totally. No, every day on set when I'm holding my sides, I go, what if I don't know how to do this scene? What if I don't? Know? What if I don't? I don't think you think, oh, I'm on this huge Netflix show. You just think, I hope I can do my job today. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and and so then in those moments, the goal is to just quiet those those voices of self-doubt and yeah. push forward. It's pointless. It's because also I think you've got to at a certain point go, these people have faith in me. Yeah. So it's actually rude for me to not have it in myself. Like when I got cast, I was like, why has Shonda Rhimes decided I can do this job? And I was like, shut up. And she knows what she's doing. Like you need to, that's, it's not a helpful thing to say to yourself. It's just, yeah, completely unhelpful. That goes back to the ensemble thing too, where you oh, guys yeah. are not only greater than the sum of your parts, you're also almost holding each other accountable of like a standard of of quality in your performance right 100 percent. cool yeah that's really cool um i have to let you both go soon but we have these silly questions that we ask everyone and (laughs) i warned you about it at the beginning but what is your worst (laughs) audition horror story that you would care to relive here oh (laughs) god i (laughs) mine Okay, I have one, but it was, it was, it wasn't like, I have ones where it was like me and like 700 other girls that look identical to me. Like I have all of those ones. This one is just one I remember because it was like, I don't even know if I can say who it was or what it was for, but it was like a really big British casting director for a really big sequel musical. And she was, and she was like, I want you to come in. And it was like, you're going to meet one-on-one with her. 
And it was like a big deal for me because she's a huge casting director. And you're going to sing these three songs um, and it's going to be great. So I like, I got the songs like the night before. <laughs> it's nearly about to sing one. <laughs> I was like, oh God, because I'm not a singer really. Um, I was absolutely terrified. And I just remember walking into this room and there's the casting director and there's this man at the piano and Ooh. the casting director's like, you've got five minutes to just go over with the... And then I just, I just remember just singing this really <laughs> well-known, very jolly song out of key. <laughs> the biggest casting director in England and just being like, oh God. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like a nightmare. I think it's so embedded into my psyche oh. now that I almost oh. don't want to ever th think about it again. Yeah. But that it did happen, unfortunately. And it I haven't been. seen it since, so <sighs> it's great. <laughs> you, that just reminded me of an audition that I had repressed the memory of. I had a totally oh. different story, and now I remember this one. Oh, no. Oh, God. So it was a period of time where I was having so few auditions that any I had, I was like, it doesn't matter what it is, I'm going to go and do it. So then my agent at the time was like, it's this big casting director, you're going to go meet her, it's for a music video. And I was like, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. And then she was like, but can you roller skate? And I was like, um, <laughs> yeah, like I did it as a kid. <laughs> I was like, also broke, so broke at the time. But then I went, went and bought these really cheap roller skates. So like met her in this dance studio and then like, I had to like... <laughs> We skate up and down the room for her and she was like really lovely and supportive lady but she was like yeah I think this is really good like what they needed was a professional skater and not like me but then she made me like go she was like go home and she was like can you film yourself skating some more so I remember being at the front of my sister's house like really awkwardly skating around the corner of her house and it was just mortifying and then like, obviously didn't get it and then years later it was like oh my god I need to look up that music video and the girl they had could do tricks and flips and I'm like why was I even there it was just like so embarrassing oh god <sighs> oh it goes back to that idea of like, do you have to really work to connect with this character? <laughs> Sometimes it's just not a match. <laughs> yeah. like, I like, really need a job, please. I will yep. learn. I, I mean, oh God, it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other question we like to ask is, what is one performance you think every actor should see and study and why? Ooh. Maybe something you've seen recently that's inspired you? Um... I'm going to say the all I'm going to state the obvious actor and the not so obvious performance. I'm going to state Meryl Streep mm -hmm. obviously in Death Becomes Her. Uh, <laughs> that's my favorite Meryl Streep performance and I watched it literally two nights ago. Yeah. It's yeah. fucking brilliant. <laughs> I mean, we all applaud her for her like acting chops, but her comedy, I mean her her comic timing in that film is impeccable. Yeah. Like, she's just unbelievable. Goldie Hawn is also amazing in that film. But oh. It's just such a brilliant performance. And it, it it's like, it really does show that she's just a woman of many, many talents. Yeah. And I just think it's such an incredible performance on so many levels. That movie made me go, like, where has High Camp gone? Like, why don't we have that anymore? Like, there's a real, like, it's been missing. I'm like, in the 90s, like, there was so much of it. Yeah. And now it's just, it's, I don't know, it's different. But yeah, I, I really want to bring that back, just like that. You no, know, and it goes back to, like, being bold and, like, making interesting totally. choices. And it's such an interesting performance. You are speaking my language 100%, and I'm so glad you picked Meryl. In fact, my bag, I have a tote bag that has her face on it right over there. Yes! That, that scene at the very beginning, I'm just going to go off on a tangent here. That scene yeah. at the very beginning where she's rehearsing what she's going to, how she's going to react when Goldie Hunt comes into the rehearsal room, into the backstage area, is brilliant. It's five seconds of her just being like, oh, oh, and it's so amazing. So good. It's and you're so right, good. like that oh, style so is much. like, there's not enough of that anymore. Not at all. And it's yeah. so undervalued. And when it's yeah. done correctly like that, it's like the most satisfying thing in the world. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I think, I think often I'll go for another comedy performance actually, because I feel like they're criminally undervalued. And I think 
Yes. I mean, I don't know whether this is true, but I feel like often actors who could do comedy can do drama, but I'm not always sure that drama actors can do comedy. Totally. Um, because, and, but comedy, like doing it, it's, it's so, it can be so difficult. It's a lot like, feels like volleying a ball from one person to the other. Like I learned that a lot on Dairy Girls. It's about, you have to be so tuned in. Not that you're not on drama. It's just a different, it's just a totally different, um, balance or, but, um, I'm going to say Melissa McCarthy and Bridesmaids. Ah. Everything okay. he did in it, like, it was so brilliant. Like the character within the first 10 seconds you see the whole character like the whole monologue about her like falling down the stairs of the ship and like speaking to a dolphin and then be like oh this must be your felon it's this really tall sailor guy like I'm like that is so brilliant yeah, yeah and she's like such a brilliant improviser as well it's like a lot of improv in that performance yeah, yeah. I did at my master's where I when I did my acting degree I did my master's in in improv and oh, and like looked all that up but I find that like so interesting and I love I mean when I was at university I used to love doing like improv nights and stuff like that so I just any of that type of and like uh, Wendy McClendon Covey and that as well is like you know <laughs> from like Reno 911 like all like I'm Kristen Wiig I'm just truly obsessed with if I ever even got to like breathe the same air as her I would I would probably die happy but yeah that whole gang are just brilliant 100 percent. again totally speaking my language those are two like Mwah. favorite performances <laughs> yeah um thank you both so much for joining us this was so fun and so, so informative and like honestly inspiring it sounds cheesy but oh. it's really inspiring oh. um any other parting words of wisdom before we sign off moisturize be bold. <laughs> what did you say <laughs> be bold be bold when i said moisturize your neck but look it's solid <laughs> advice both of those together are perfect <laughs> <laughs> And now it's time to hear from Christine McKenna Torella, our backstage casting insider. I will let her take it away. Hi guys, Christine McKenna Torella here. I love when our actors and creators honestly share with us the road they went on to get into the interview chair. And Nicola and Phoebe are both very generous in talking about the challenges of being an actor, the highs and lows of auditioning, the uncertainty. Even when you're making a show for Shonda Rhimes for Netflix, you're never quite sure about what the product's going to be. And of course, it ended up being Bridgerton and it's launched them into huge stars. This leads really nicely into another question from the inbox. One of the backstage members wrote and said, I'm having issues getting back into the swing of auditioning and routine post-COVID. What do you recommend? Well, I have five things that you can do to improve your acting career that are not directly related to acting. One, build a morning routine and stick with it. Extra points if you make it an early morning routine, but as long as you're consistent at what you do every day, you'll set yourself up for success for the rest of the day. If you're looking for hints about what to build into that daily routine, I've got the next four points for you to consider. So the second point is meditate. Start small. Use an app to help you, but just a few minutes a day will have a huge effect. Meditating can help improve your focus and increase your creativity. Three, use daily affirmations. I've talked about this before. I'm a huge fan. There is an app called ThinkUp. There's another one called Spirit Junkie. There, there, there's a lot of, lot of products out there that you can consider, but affirmations help build your goals and influence that internal dialogue inside. So you say nice things to yourself. I think it's so important as an actor to have a good mindset. Four, journal. Start with three things that you're grateful for every day. Gratitude journals are shown to enhance our optimism and overall feelings of happiness. And finally, exercise every day. So I'm not encouraging seven days of intense hit workouts here, right? Like, but 20 minutes of sweat three times a week will go a long way. And on your days off, go for an intentional walk or stretch or just move your body. It will relieve stress and improve your mood and help you sleep better at night. And we all know more sleep equals more functionality. These seemingly unrelated things will help you boost your confidence, keep you motivated and creative and focused. I hope this helps. 
on to the casting calls for this week. In the UK, there is a major casting for a festive feature film that will be on a, a streamer. They're seeking talent that are children that are natively northern from the UK, right? So that means Greater Manchester or West Yorkshire accents. Um, take a look at the casting on the site. For our British talent, they're looking to build their resume. In the UK, there is a key casting for background for a major TV series that is about World War II. This will be taping in Oxford in late summer. It's something to think about if you're interested in doing featured and background work. And there is a major search for full-figured dancers for an unscripted project for Amazon featuring Lizzo. I love Lizzo. The production states, Are you ready to step into your part and change the world? Here's your chance to twerk it out on world stages and stomp it on the runway for the adventure of a lifetime. That sounds exciting. For any dancers out there, take a look. Details for all of these are on the site. As always, there are hundreds of castings for every type of actor in every region on the site. So head over to backstage.com to check those out. That's all from me for now. (laughs) Break a leg in your upcoming auditions and have a beautiful week. In the Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Rouse Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.